Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm broadcasting from a beautiful day here in Washington, D.C. Probably one of the best days. The cherry blossoms are at peak in the tidal basin. It's just beautiful to be around. Um, like I said, I'm Ricky Ellison. I am the founder and chairman of the Muscle Defense Advocacy Alliance that we built uh, 20 years ago. And our sole mission, only mission, is, is to create, develop, and deploy missile defenses for our nation around the world to make our world a safer place. And it, it is absolutely required everywhere. We've heard it uh, from testimony yesterday, from our war fighters, and we're moving forward with that effort with, with great momentum coming behind us on that. This is our 58th, uh, 58th Congressional Roundtable discussion that we do. And it's pretty exciting on this one. This is from rhetoric, from rhetoric to weapons in the U.S. Navy's uh, kinetic uh, weapons in the sea lanes of the world. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to sit behind Admiral Aquilino at the posture hearings at the House Armed Service Committee. And what what it stands out from our from our Congress, and I'm going to say rhetoric, but from our Congress, from the leadership, is that we are not in regional fights with regional enemies. This is a global fight. This is a global movement where Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran share technologies, and specifically, just from our perspective, they are sharing. With creating drones, creating missiles, ballistic missiles, they are sharing those lessons learned. And if you look at what's going on in Ukraine, they are producing you know, drones by the thousands. They are on 24-hour shifts. That technology, not the technology, is how they do it, has been proliferated to Iran, to proliferate North Korea. So you're getting just a maximum amount of proliferation of cheap. Uh, capabilities that we are seeing being distributed around the world and against us. Because from that perspective, it is a cost curve. When you have a $10,000 uh, weapon coming at you and you've got to shoot it down, and, and we have some, obviously, some cheap weapons, but in depth, we end up, if you, if you don't have enough, we end up shooting, you know, two $200,000 missiles from the, or the Coyote system, or 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 the Roadrunner, or or the SN2, or the, it just goes on, and we have to do that. The cost of a four million, two million, is still worth the cost of saving 300 sailors on a 2.5 billion dollar ship. That's worth it, but we are not winning this cost curve. And we've got to figure out a way to be able to reduce the cost of kinetic energy intercepts, reduce non-kinetic interceptors and put them more in the field to at least equal that cost of intercept. And you just can't ignore it, just like Ukraine. You, you, they, they lost their Patriot radar because they, had, they, they flew 75 missiles, drones at that radar and they were able to successfully take out 72 of them, and they emptied the entire <laughs> their entire inventory, but two got through and, and did the job. So it, it's also about being able to have enough capability as well as cheap capability to go with it to get this moving. So I, without a doubt, our U.S. Navy has the best weapon system for integrated layered missile defense in the world, and they did that because they had to deal with to protect the sea lanes. And the sea lanes have been challenged since the early 70s and continue to be challenged. And so our Navy with MDA has developed the best ever layered missile defense system that goes all the way from space all the way to a Gatling gun if it gets close to the ship. And it is our best system. And we're seeing that challenged. We're seeing the U.S. Car Carney in the Red Sea and it's been kicking ass. Excuse me. It's been it's been winning. And you know, in fact, we have our our missile defender of the year. By the way, the MDA missile defender of the year. She is the lieutenant commander of the fire control. Uh, I think it's 
Rebecca Fleming is on that ship. But the Navy is ahead of everybody in a single platform defending international sea lanes. So I, this is where we, we want to go at. We want to ask our practitioners and experts in this panel to, to lean into this and, and give us solutions, give us what the problem sets are and how, how we move to protect our Navy, but also how do we use those technologies to go elsewhere in the land and all the fight to be able to integrate. So that's that's where we're going with the discussion. Um, I've got a great honor to have, have Tom Drugan with us. and. and these are practitioners. He, he is a senior associate at CIS, the Missile Defense Project. But much more importantly, he's a he was a developer of the Aegis system, the Aegis weapon system. Right. And, 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 and having his insight of being able to understand where we're going and how this thing works and where do you get to a place where at least to, you know, to, to get that cheap capability out in front is here. So welcome, Tom. Uh, Thank you for coming, and I appreciate it. So, no, it's a pleasure, and it's also an honor to uh, represent not only CSIS, but also Strategic Insight Limited, which is a company that I lead here in Crystal City. So I'd like you to think about a world where we didn't have Aegis, and what would happen in the Red Sea. We actually have just proven the value of missile defense, because otherwise any terrorist group, any small group, could shut down sea lands globally. All right. If you think about that impact, particularly in today's world where a terrorist group is not necessarily confined to a particular territory, and obviously with communications today, things can be coordinated. Multiple, multiple sea lanes and choke points could be shut down all at once, except we do have missile defense. And we have air and missile defense, Aegis weapon system on board our Aegis destroyers and cruisers that provide that capability for the sea lanes to continue to be open and operate. Yeah. Now there's risk, there's elevated risk, no question about that. <laughs> um, and you see that reflected in insurance policies and some companies saying, well, we're gonna take an extra three plus weeks and go around the Horn of Africa to get to our, our port. But there's plenty of others that are accepting that risk, knowing that uh, a large part of the, the threat is neutralized and mitigated by the United States Navy and the Aegis Weapon System, and the Red Sea is Exhibit A of that. Um, I think at, at the, uh, the the Houthis uh, really thought that they could shut down all shipping through their use of anti-ship cruise missiles, drones, anti-ship cruise missiles, and anti-ship ballistic missiles. And uh, my personal thought is um, there was a calculus that the anti-ship ballistic missiles were a trump card, that we wouldn't be able to defend against those. But we can, um, and he just has that capability. So we have over 100 plus attacks total, right? The mix of those is drone attacks, anti-ship cruise missiles, and anti-ship ballistic missiles, which the Houthis did not make themselves. All that, most of that given to them. And so they're operating on behalf of Iran and some others, right? In order to um, make a point and shut down the sea lanes and shut down international trade and we're talking about one out of six, one out of seven, you know, tons um, go through the Babel and Deb and the Red Sea for trade. That's a huge chunk of world trade. So this local event could have had global effect, and instead, it's been highly mitigated and and by the by the mis air missile defense of the United States Navy. I think that's a tribute to the work the Navy has done over the past really 30, 40 years. Um, and how seriously we take air and missile defense. It's a tribute that we built on the air defense capability of Aegis and went the next step with the ballistic missile defense. Um, and frankly, with the Missile Defense Agency having now investing in the glide phase interceptor and the Aegis weapon system, we're going to extend that capability again. So we're going from anti-ship drone and anti-ship cruise missile to hypersonic missile defense all the way up to ballistic missile defense all on the fighting integers, individual shifts, which will have the full capability. At the end of the day, that's a tremendous asset, not just for the Navy, but also for the combatant commanders, as well as the nation, right? Because they're mobile, each one's sovereign territory. We can put them where we need them, when we need them. Um, we operate at some risk, right? As we saw um, <clears throat> our forefathers, the, 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 sh the shoulders of the giants that we engineered on, we're, we're very appreciative in the sense that layered was very important. It, 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 had we only invested in terminal defense, um, I'm sure that we would have damage to American ships. 
you have to be able to attract these rays over time and battle space. And you have to be able to hold the archer at risk. Uh, so today, we're, the preponderance of our effort is defensive. Uh, from the United States Navy, we're doing some offensive operations. But as you heard in testimony uh, over the past week, uh, we are not at the point of dissuading um, um, the, the, the aggression, right? Things are not slowing down. So unfortunately, this appears to be a steady state of arms flowing to the Houthis, and then they're using them uh, against not just commercial shipping, but our allies, the warships of our allies, and United States warships. And so that's a geopolitical situation Is that, that has long-term consequences. With the cost, the low cost of being able to do it, they're able to... So, well, that's right. So the low cost of the drones, which can de deplete inventories, right? Okay. So we've known drones have been coming, just to be clear. We've known drones are coming uh, for a decade. In fact, if you go back in time, Aegis used to not track drones because they were very much like clutter, atmospheric, uh, particulate matter. Um, but we knew they were coming. So we, we improved the program so that we could track UAVs, UASs, you know, the nomenclature oh, of okay. drones. About, about a decade. <laughs> and to, to get that capability. So we knew they were coming. Now, we also want other ways to shoot them down besides missiles. But that's not where we are today. The systems that are coming that are counter UAS, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and counter drone um, are being fielded, but not at the pace that you where they can be just pushed out right to these ships. So um, we have a developmental laser program, uh, but that's only been fielded on one ship. We have some electronic warfare techniques that we can use and systems we can use. Those aren't widespread. I'll talk about later. That's not a panacea at all. It's still a problem for the commanding officer. He has some key choices to make in defending mm -hmm. his or her ship. Um, so there's some other, so when you get to the non-kinetic side, it's not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet. There's still important decisions to be made there. And then um, some other kinetic weapons. Fortunately, we've started to use 5-inch 54 and 5-inch 62 uh, lightweight gun mounts <clears throat> to um, work on the drone problem. So we can get on the right side of the cost curve. That work has been going pretty well, um, and there's been good success there. Uh, some of our, again, our electronic warfare systems, the ones that are out there, have been successful. Unfortunately, both those are pretty close range, and that's the conundrum. Can you get those concept. systems out, out, out of the ship into the water in front of it? Is that where we're going? Well, we're where we we're, one of the things we should go is we should have anti-drone drones, right? Counter yeah, those UAS. Yeah. Um, not just systems, but drones, which can then be placed out at range as a perimeter. So why can't we do that? Well, we can. We could. I can't keep it's, a, it's a matter of, of, of will and approval and then pushing those out, right? And those can be standalone systems. They don't have to be integrated. When you get to the laser, when you get to some of these other electronic warfare, they're most, they would be most effective if they were integrated with Aegis. Right now, the impetus is to, to get those systems out and the integration then follow. Sometimes that doesn't always happen, right? Once systems are out, we forget about the enhanced uh, capability that we could have if we actually integrated it with the full sensor suite, the full command and control of the Aegis weapon system. So that integration does not always happen. Um, hopefully in this case, given the fact that this is going to be a pervasive threat going forward, no question about it. Even more pervasive, on ground ground warfare. When do they get to the overmatch point? Have we reached that where they can overmatch the system with the So any system anywhere, and you saw this in Ukraine with the Pac-3 radar, can be overwhelmed, right? Now we have some advantages in the Navy where anything that's launched against us has to have a seeker so that because ships are moving all the time, right? We also have sea space. So that if we need to buy time and battle space, we can maneuver at high speed and buy some. Now, against an anti-ship cruise missile or an anti-ship ballistic missile, that's not much, that's not going to change the calculus because they're they're so fast, right? Against a drone that's only going 100 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, you can buy time and battle space with maneuver, and that gives you other options. And we've only been talking about single ships so far. We can always operate in packs. Uh, we can always operate multi-ship. Um, 
uh, events, exercises, but importantly, naval operations in this case, and that gives you options. So that's doing well. like carrier fleet escort and all that. Is Carib it? Or just, you know, multiple leadership ships working together. Could you Very talk, powerful. Could you talk a little different about the Taiwan Straits with ships versus the Red Sea? Is that a different strategy for, for the, 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 the primary difference is scale, right? If we have a conflict in the Western Pacific, we, we will be, it won't be every few days or once a week that there's an attack. It's, it'll it's be scary. full on. To, to pushing through constant combat. So this and the scale is not a few drones. It's many, many, many drones. It's not a few anti-ship cruise missiles. It's scores of anti-ship cruise missiles. It's not a few anti-ship ballistic missiles. It's you know scores of those as well. So um, again, we have advantages against each and each one of those types of threats. Um, one is if you're in the Taiwan Straits, you lose some because it's clear where you are. Right. So, but maneuver plays a key part. Is that undefendable? I mean, I'm, I'm against something. Well, I wouldn't say it's, unde it's undefendable. And remember, we're not a one trick pony. It's not the United States Navy by itself. Okay. All right. There are other assets out there to help the joint force. Right. So, this includes everything from left of launch into bringing in air power, whether it's naval air power or whether it's air force where, uh, um, power. We do have some levels of INW. What would take us to the Straits? in Taiwan. Uh, number one is freedom of navigation operations. Right. That's just a reminder that, hey, these are international waters, right? Um, I wouldn't expect a conflict to arise from that kind of operation. Will we be followed? Will we be tailed? Yes. Possibly targeted? Yes. Do I expect a, a kinetic launch during a freedom of navigation operation? I would not. There would have to be something else going on. So what else would take us there? But, that would be armed conflict, right? An attack on But there are critics in Congress that say, why do we need an aircraft carrier? Because we can't defend the fight. Can you defend the aircraft carrier? You can defend the, the aircraft carrier. Overwhelming missiles. That that's well, so you have so, to back so if you're gonna, carrier. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna back us into a box and say the carrier is all by itself and there's a million missiles coming, come on. That's not that's not the world we live in. The world we live in is, is much more complex. There's lots more options on the table, and that includes not just Navy options, but Joint Force options. It includes national options, right? All of which are on the tables. There's denial of adversary capability. There's deception. There's maneuver. There's um, and then there's layer of defenses. All right. Is it an impregnable citadel? No. Is there is there acceptable risk here to, to move in and do what we need to do? Absolutely. But we're part trying to figure out the gaps, right? We're trying to do everything we can. Listen, Admiral Aquilino is a true warfighter. And he he is leading the thinking and the strategy in Indopaycom. And they, they've got they've got multiple options on the table. But you, you can't just say, well, in this situation, situation is going to evolve. There's options every step of the way. And remember, we're we're trying to deter and dissuade. That's um, and that's important. That is one of the concerning things about the Red Sea is that, according to the testimony, Iran is not being deterred or dissuaded in supporting the Houthis. So again, we're at a steady state, which is not a good place to be with you know ordnance, a com combat environment uh, being launched against commercial shipping and allied shipping and United States Navy warships on a regular basis. So there's different ways to change that. One's diplomacy, one's military offensive action, one's threats, one's sanctions. Lots of, of options here. The, the, it's currently the mission, of, of course, assigned to the United States Navy is air and missile defense of, of the Red Sea and all assets there. Let's go back to the Pacific. Just can you can you just talk a little bit about hypersonic glide interceptors or hypersonic? Sure. So let's talk, your ships you yeah, so let's talk about it. This is, this is a threat it, that's grown. No, it's very good because there's a lot of um, um, misconceptions about hypersonic weapons. All right, we've been doing anti-ship cruise missile defense for decades. All right, so that's number one. We've been doing many decades. We've been doing ballistic missile defense, well understood. That's intercepts in space and also for terminal. We've been doing that for a few decades now as well in the United States Navy in the Aegis weapon system. Hypersonics, let's talk about hypersonics. When you talk about hypersonics, you have to divide the conversation. You have to know what you're talking about because context matters. I've seen good people, really smart people talk past each other because one was talking about hypersonic missile defense 
against nuclear armed hypersonic threats if for the homeland. That's a that's that's strategic deterrence. That's national policy, and that's where you know where we have our nuclear response. That is not but, what but most of the time what we're talking about. Just the regional threat is the regional threat. Juan and Hawaii are, are well, U.S. home. Right? So I just no, no, no. But the, the dividing line here is nuclear threat against the, the homeland. Okay. In which case we have a strategic deterrent posture, which is you know, which is a re nuclear response, right? Right, right. Versus conventionally armed hypersonic threat. See, you walked right into it, right? Oh. So, so <clears throat> we have to. So, where the Navy is is the the primary capability that's being developed is to be able to take on conventionally armed hypersonic threats, right? Can because if it's nuclear it? armed, we have a strategic deterrent posture. Can we distinguish between that? You don't know ahead of time. So how do you? Okay, I just. You don't know ahead of time. You have to wait and take the first hit. Well, your choice here is okay. It's just to assume it's nuclear. We're going to rely on the strategic okay. deterrent policy, and we're not going to invest in in a, in a uh, conventional capability. Is that in, which, in which case, you're giving the enemy a free shot. That looks with like conventionally armed. Is that what we're doing? No, what we're, we're doing is a smart thing. Up to thirty-five. Well, right, but at least the investment. <laughs> We can talk about the scale of the investment, but the investment has started. It is there to develop uh, two pieces of a, a glide of a hypersonic threat counter, hypersonic missile defense. The first one is the still on the ships, right? This, hang this, on. This the first one is the ship, right? And today we have a full capability for hypersonic missile defense in the terminal, right? That's okay. right. So we got that, right? Um, then we want to add a layer. Why? Because you need to try to raid over time and battle space yep. to make sure that you can defeat the whole raid. That's why the glide phase interceptor program exists. It's at a longer range. And the point there is to get the hypersonic threat in its cruise phase where it is not maneuvering very much and it is a, a straightforward target, right? Um, it's an easier target than terminal, much easier, order of magnitude easier to take out a hypersonic glide vehicle or hypersonic thread in its cruise phase than it is in terminal phase. No question about that. So then we get to targeting. Well, we have the uh, organic capability with the spy radar. We have multi-ship spy radars, both of those very good uh, in this realm. And then the missile defense agency, but that's still kind of local, right? Um, or maybe area. Um, but for these threats, because they are maneuverable over long distances, we have to get to a space-based tracking solution for cradle-to-grave track custody. Yeah. Got to have yeah. it. So the HBTSS system, the hypersonic and ballistic yeah. threat surveillance system, is going through prototyping this year. Uh, they're up, right? Yeah. Um, in launch. Yeah. And and now that's being filled in, and then it'll be over to the space development agency. And uh, and to put this on one of their tranches going up in the future to provide a 24-7, 365 global surveillance capability against hypersonic threats. And from space, hypersonics, absolutely detectable. And and uh, we already know that. Yeah. So now it's all about what, what kind of constellation do you need? Where do you put it? Well, how many, how many do you put in the constellation? Which part do you start first? So those are all um, important. So back to the glide phase interceptor. Glide phase interceptor is down to two competitors, and the technical risk is really um, just in, in one, you know, that terminal guidance part. So this is this is not. We're out of the science and technology. We're out of guessing. Yeah. We're out of the really hard work, so and we're in. We're in. It's very doable, and it's straight engineering. The path is clear uh, in order to, to get a capability. Okay, yes. so good you. Um, thank you, Tom. What, what a great conversation. <laughs> All right, Mark. So we have a we have a, a practitioner. I mean, Mark's on our board. He's obviously a former of the the three in Indo Paycom or Paycom when it was well known in strategy of U.S. Navy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Montgomery. Thank <clears throat> thanks. So first, I'll talk about um, uh, what's going on in the Red Sea, and then maybe a little bit on. Uh, Hypersonics. Um, so first, I think there's some things that there's four positives, uh, you know, four affirmative things we can take away 
or that we can see in this red in this uh, uh, the operations of the Red Sea over the last five months. Number one is validation. You know, as uh, Tom referred to, this is validation of the Aegis weapon systems and the surface warfare operators that have been utilizing them. Something we don't get in the surface Navy that often. Um, you know, very you know maybe once every 40 years. So, I mean, this has been a, a good experience. And for those of us who come from an Aegis background, you know, build a little, test a little, learn a little, we're learning a lot, you know, and this is good. It's not just good for the several hundred fire patrolmen, OSs and officers that are operating this equipment and gutters mates that are operating this equipment, but it's also <clears> really good for the system engineers because we have really invested a lot over the last few years. In fact, Tom did when he was in the job in our ability to rapidly turn around assessments of, of shots and get that information back to the warfighter, enhance your doctrine, enhance your, your skill sets. So I think that's been um, really good. We've had some some accidental validations like of CWIS, not something I think I'd want as a CO, but glad it worked. Um, you know, And so I think that there's been some of that. And, and I think Tom's right. It, it has taught us a lot about um, uh, you know the the high cost right now of almost all U.S. Navy assets being used. I recognize SeaWiz and guns present some opportunity. Uh, particularly SeaWiz, not one that you you know rely you know you rely on for first uh, for first effort. Um, but but that's to me that's been good. And uh, and I think also the ballistic missile shoot downs are good. I think we learn a lot from that. It's good some good validation of things we assumed would work but now know would work. And by the way. We're shooting down slightly unstable weapons. That in and of itself gives us more validation. It's, sometimes it's it's easier to shoot down that nice Kratos missile that we built and and polished to a fine you know hue and then launched at you and it did exactly as expected. Vice you know kind of the hillbilly ballistic missile that's you know pulling lefts and right jinks and jags uh, all the way into the shot. So for me, number one's validation. Number two is let's remember who did this. It's Iran. I get we say it's the Houthis, but but so after the three uh, service members were killed at, at Tower 22 in Jordan, and we started to strike back finally, way too late, but still uh, strike back both in Iraq and Syria and uh, down in uh, Yemen. Um, the attacks from IRGC proxy groups in Iraq and Syria against our forces have stopped. Uh, but the Houthis are still attacking, and as Tom said, the Houthis do not have a ballistic missile or cruise missile or even drone missile factory. They're getting these pieces and parts. They may assemble some of them in, in uh, Yemen, but they're getting them from the Iranians either by sea or uh, or by a short sea followed by a land bridge over uh, Oman. And, um, you know, at some point we're going to need to hold that supply line accountable and strike that, either strike shipping or strike, you know, inform the Omanis, you have 24 hours to stop this. When they don't stop it, call them the next day to say, that was us who violated your sovereignty and struck all those, uh, that supply chain moving through your country. But we absolutely have to knock down this, the supply chain from Iran and hold them accountable. Um, I do think, uh, probably a little different than Tom and this, I do think it's still impacting trade, particularly on the, L, on the oil and LNG. I think there's such short margins, low margins on cargo shipping, container shipping, that a higher percentage of that is still making the run uh, through the Suez. But overall, Suez tickets are down about 45% still. So I mean, there is a, there is an effect, and and then that extra 10 to 20% cost in shipping introduces a mild inflationary effect inside the Europe. So there's, there's still some impact. Um, and so uh, I like it. And I'm not sure that we're actually protecting U.S. ships only because there isn't a whole lot to the U.S. merchant marine. I mean, these days, there's not a whole lot of U.S. ships out there. Um, but we are protecting shipping. And this is a principle that all of us who served in the Navy have believed in, you know, for 225 years, or uh, probably since about 1810, 1850, that we are one of the nations that protects the world's uh, shipping lanes. So uh, I think we did. So number two is Iran. Number three is holy crap, we need to get our directed energy act together. Um, you know, this is, a, a Tom referred to it, but we need to get the Helio system out. Look, the reason we're not good at directed energy, in my opinion, is senior officers like myself and others, I won't throw Tom in this bus, but he might belong in it with me, you know, who five and seven years ago, or even 10 years ago, we just kind of like things that crash into each other. We're like, I get how you destroy that missile with another missile. 
and directed energy just had too many unknown unknowns to it. Well, let's be clear, those are those are those they're not all solved, but they're broadly at an engineering level resolved. And we can have directed energy. We have a system Helios, a high energy laser and um, optical dazzler and uh, surveillance system, right? So uh, it happens to be Lockheed Martin, doesn't have to be. Um, it's about at 60 kW plus. Uh, we have one of them, as Tom said, uh, I'll add it and say it's a pebble, is our test ship. Uh, slight Navy oops in that we assigned the preble for a, uh, a um, home port shift to Yakuska, not the test range. Um, so we got to get our act together quickly on that. Uh, we need to get these directed energies out there. The, the Army, who also struggled with this, is finally getting its directed energy uh, systems in the Middle East. And the Israelis, probably the other country of our allies who really tracks with us on this, is still working hard on Iron Beam. But a lot of work needs to be done. And I do think we could be getting a little bit of the old build a little, test a little, learn a lot if we had Helios out in the Red Sea right now. Um, but, you know, so from my point of view, we've got to get work on that. This is mostly about, as Ricky averred to, the cost curve. Uh, in the end, our adversaries build, particularly drones, but even their crews and ballistic missiles, quite a bit less than our intercept costs of a SM-6 for a ballistic missile or an SM-2 for a uh, for a cruise missile or an ESSM. Um, it's only when you get down to the gun rounds that we get kind of on a, on a par, but directed energy, and obviously CWIS uh, is a cost savings, although at some risk, um, you know, but, but we need to get, get these directed energies in there. The thing I would say, one thing this is not, um, it's not a validation of our tactics and readiness for Taiwan. This is not the Taiwan fight. Tom referred to some of the issues in there. I agree, it's, it, it's you know, the, the speed with which you go Winchester in a Taiwan fight is, you know, can be measured in watches. Uh, you know, that's four hour long watches, not days or weeks. Um, and, you know, by the way, this a good lesson learned from here. You better learn how to reload at sea soon. Um, and uh, if you can't reload at sea, then you better be able to build temporary reload facilities rapidly in lots of godforsaken places, because we're going to have to be able to, re you know, you can't be sending ships back to rotor or wherever to get a reload. You know, you need to be sending ships, you know, two to four to 600 miles for a reload or go to a, a ammunition ship for a reload if we could get to that level of skill set. By the way, we had the same issue with torpedoes. Uh, we got to figure that out for Taiwan. We got to figure it out for, for the surface ships too. Um, and uh, and I, I think that, but it reminds us that surface ships will be operating in combat. Sometimes when you think about combat in Taiwan, you tend to hear Mark 48 ad caps and then El Rasms and Power JDAM and other things off of B1s, F18s, F15s, maybe eventually B52s on the on the El Rasm, and, and that's it. And uh, but the the reality is, uh, we're going to start delivering maritime to strike tomahawk. It it uh, it suffered a little bit from being the Phoenix Suns of uh, of anti ship missiles, you know, in the sense that it's taken uh, every two years. It seems to be two years away. But I think we're getting close on that. And as we deliver that to the to the fleet, I think surface ships are gonna be closer to the fight and they're gonna to have to be able to fight individually or in small surface action groups. So this is a little bit of validation for that, not a lot. Um, uh, the final thing, I do wanna jump into the hypersonics and just say, you know, on hypersonics, I agree with Tom, there's two capabilities. There's a terminal one, and then there's a glide, a glide phase intercept. On the terminal one, you better want you better have a uh, better thin the herd, right? I don't I, I don't want to get into too much te te techniques involved, but you don't want a whole lot of inbound in the terminal phase simultaneously. You want to thin the herd. You thin the herd in the glide phase. Um, we've known this. We have systems. The problem we have is we have two competing systems um, that are not on the same timeline, and the Navy and DoD more broadly DoD is trying to like get. You know, I at some level, we're, I wouldn't say we're delaying it, but we're certainly slow rolling the development as we try to get these two. So that's a mistake. You know, my personal opinion mm -hmm. is we're working offensive hypersonics like a drunken sailor. We had eight systems. We're down to seven. We might be down to six soon, but we're going to end up with three or four because I can count three or four services and every service wants a, you know, bite in this game. I think even the Marine Corps is going to try to figure out how to be there, but the Navy, Air Force, and Army are each going to have weapon systems. We... There may be multiple ones in, in the Air Force particularly, um, but the bottom line is <clears throat> we're building three, four, five different 
um, long, you know, hypersonic attack systems. We're spending, uh, you know, we're, we're getting up towards the, you know, six, eight billion a year in spending on that. We're definitely four to five billion right now. Um, and yet we're spending on the hypersonic missile defense effector, you know, DOD's persistent input is 195 to 215 million a year. I, look, I, I'm not a rocket scientist like Tom, but I can tell that if you're spending four billion to six billion on one end and 200 million on the on the on the stop them end, you're you're out of sync, right? I'm not saying lower the uh, the offensive. I'm saying put more into the defensive. And by the way, bet on both systems. And as soon as one system's ready to go into into production, down select to it and move out. And if you're wrong. This is the exact kind of thing you could be wrong on. We've heard the Department of Defense over the last three secretaries say, we got to take more risk. We got to have a, we have a broken acquisition system. We got to take acquisition system. We got to take more risk. We got to do more things. Well, here's a perfect example to do it. Hypersonic defense, bet on one system, continue to R&D the other. If it turns out to be kick-ass, bet on that system. And you know what? Having two types of interceptors in, in the hypersonic life phase might be good because there are different types of hypersonic attack weapons, uh, how they, you know, whether they use scramjets or not, issues like that, that, that definitely uh, would want you to have varying types of interceptors on the defensive side. So from my perspective, we have got to get hot on this, Ricky, and there is no way that the FY25 <clears throat> budget submitted last week meets the congressional mandate to have an initial operating capability in 2029. I mean, I think that we're with the DOD's current planning, we'll be lucky to see an IOC by 2034, 2035. And I'll just for, for any of us that are going to be operating on those ships or have, you know, kids or grandkids operating on those ships, that's a pretty BS answer to say we're going to allow the adversary to have a capability out there for three, four, five years for which we have no answer, you know, in, in, in the main, you know, that we don't, where we can't thin the herd and give the terminal f defense a chance to win. All right, I'll pass it back to you. Mark, Mark, you Mark, what's the answer then? What is the answer? Is it is well, the, the plus is, up to, to plus up money to that? To so get Congress it? what it does every year, which is double the R and D, so that you can pay for both companies to. Still move the time frame. Then down, you know, DoD needs to down select, and um, you know, Tom and I have talked about this separately, and that would cause if you did a down select, that would cause a real budget item to pop in. You know, for for operational testing and procure, you know, low uh, procurement and eventually low rate initial procurement, you know, for a system. But you can't get to that till you get out of the R and D and and get and get a down select decision. So, in, double the R and D again is the twenty. I think we just saw that in the twenty twenty four budget that's signed out a couple hours ago. Uh, the twenty twenty five. In other words, it, a DoD had put in I think about two hundred million. I I think the number's going to come out at four hundred million. I got to it, it literally just popped. So we have to take a look. Uh, but on top of that, um, the, take the 2025 one, increase that, and then give them the money to support a down select so, decision. Uh, if yeah. they don't do this, Ricky, they're not going to make 2029. Mark, what's the best scenario? Number. How many years would that knock out from 34, 35? Uh -huh. If you did it this way, uh -huh. would we have it in 30 or 31 or 29 or 28? What? What's, what's, I think if you fix this in the 25 budget, really fix it, I think you could be supporting a uh, some kind of L rep for initial operating capability in 29, uh, but you'd really have to do that now. And DoD would have to be, would have to kind of stand up, do their job, and 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 push uh, one of the systems in. And like I said, I'm not against either system. I think both of them need to be produced, just like I think we need three, four, or five offensive systems. It is but on this system. MDA's yeah. got to be the enabler, right? Is it is it MDA's got to be able to do this? Yeah. This is MDA. This is not the Army or the Navy. As it, you know, as it happens, I, I think one of these interceptors might be something the Navy would recognize, and one of these systems might be something that the Joint Force collectively might might recognize. But you know, the I, I just think, you know, I think you know, I think the Department. This is not MDA. This is the Department of Defense, not prioritizing this issue. We know that. I, I don't understand why. I can't believe it's money. They're spending 900 billion or 880 billion a year. You, you know, we're not talking about big money. We're talking about pocket lint on that budget. Uh, I think it's a principle of they just don't see the, the sense of urgency that a lot of the rest of us see. Uh, Lynn was up there 
27 for the last five years. I mean, and they still are not moving. Tom, do you have any thoughts on this? I just said the hypersonic uh, glide threat, right? The hypersonic glide vehicle, which is a hypersonic missile threat, is has been fully tested and is in production. And that's a problem for us, right? I mean, the enemies, the enemies. Yeah, the enemies, the, the, bad, the bad guys. Yes. That's a right. mismatch. Now, the other way to say that is there's there, the threat is coming now. It takes a while to build up numbers, right? But still, yeah. the threat, all, all the they have tested their way. They have tested their way to capability. But but we you <laughs> both agree that you can move that from 34, 35 to 29 under reasonable this conditions. Why, this is why it's important to recognize that we're through the S and T. Yeah, <clears throat> we were still in S and T, and there's really high risk areas, particularly multiple high risk areas, um, then then you can't say that because you're you're deep into unknown. That's not true here. There there's one risk area. So I, I don't even think it's high risk, right? It's not. And everything else is straight into it. Much of which has been done before. So we're really talking about the front end of this missile. We're not talking about the booster. We're not talking about the first stage. We're not talking about the second stage. Yeah. We're not talking about the third stage, right? We're not. We're talking about the front end, and we're only talking about a couple items in the front end. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I think I think the risk is first of all, and DoD is nefarious, right? They 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 will embrace. Like I'm for doing things with Japan. I want to do everything we can with Japan, but I don't want to bring Japan into this unless it's in a completely non-delay way. I think DoD on the other hand is happy to bring them in a way that delays things. I, and I don't look. I can't understand it. I think it has something to do with with Tom referred to earlier about a there's a nuclear non nuclear kind of thought process on this, and <laughs> there's still a handful of of people who <laughs> mistakenly think that this is some kind of like strategic de, that that this kind of missile defense is strategically destabilizing. That is insane. I will tell you what's destabilizing is your adversary having a capability, conventional capability, oh. that schwacks every. I, IRBM and SRBM and cruise missile capability you have on night one so that the next day all his other stuff hits you. Now, they're going to do that in a way that kills hundreds of sailors or soldiers, not millions, like a nuclear thing. And you suddenly, the idea that you would respond nuclear in a nuclear way to a conventional hypersonic attack is completely illogical. So, so today was worth it just for this discussion because <laughs> this point that Hypersonic threats may be nuclear, but just because they may be doesn't mean they are. And you have to assume in a regional fight, they're conventionally armed, and we have to have a response. Okay, I want to just shift it for a little bit before the questions back from a 20 million intercept. I don't know what that cost is going to be for that thing, but it's going to be a lot, all the way down to the overmatch that could happen on our ships with cheaper capability weapons coming at us. What are the best ways, whether it's electrical rail gun, laser, or getting sensors and shooters away from the ship out there beyond the line of sight to develop? Is, is that doable? How do we, because you can't, the, you, you, the cost is too much for all these weapons. I mean, you're not going to get every, these ships fully capable. I don't think. So how, you gotta, how do you reduce some of the costs that we are in to do these intercepts? by having innovative technology. I'm just throwing it out there. So one is directed energy, right? One, so we'll say lasers. Helio's a good example, exhibit A. So the other thing is electronic attack, right? That's where you have an active EW system that's really putting energy and trying to burn out electronics, UAVs, drones, highly susceptible to that kind of attack, right? So there's that. There's um, smaller kinetic interceptors, Right, that are much shorter range, but you could have them in quantities out the LS doesn't exist today. Right. Um, on top of that, you can have anti-drone drones, counter UA, UAS systems. Okay. They exist, they're just not on Navy ships today. Could be. Um, so there's there's good options everywhere. There's even um, you know, with some radars, you may be able to put energy on uh something and have an effect. All of that is a rich environment for us to get after. Here's the conundrum. Every commanding officer, every officer, commission officer, sworn to protect and defend the United States of America, right against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Chapter eight of Navy regulations, the commanding officer is responsible for the defense of their ship. Period. 
not during, doesn't say just in peacetime, doesn't say just in wartime, all the time. All right, and to use all tools at their disposal, right? So what is the CO to do? What is he or she to do when there's a raid of drones, cheap drones inbound? How long are you asking them to wait? Are you going to ask them not to use a missile and wait for one of these short range systems to have their effects? It's a conundrum. And when you're when you have the duty to defend your ship, or in this case, international shipping lanes, right, and commercial shipping, yes, not US. You have you, your your duty says use all means at your disposal, which includes your more expensive air defense missiles, right? It includes everything you've got. And frankly, you'd like a little time, right? And to wait for a, a, an electronic warfare system to be effective, you have to wait till they're pretty close. That's the conundrum. And then you're not guaranteed that they're all gonna work because if they if the raid is large enough, how's your electronic warfare, your, your laser, your gun, how's it gonna service all those targets? This is the conundrum, right? I'm going no, back I, to you. Go ahead. No, 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 no. It's a, I, I agree with that. And I think what we have to do is get a defense in depth of the shorter range, lower cost systems. In other words, I, I think it's reasonable to go to a CO. Just like I don't think we're using like SM6s for cruise missile intercepts. I hope I'm right on that. And they're being used for ballistic missile intercepts. But, you know, you know, an SM6 is a fairly expensive weapon uh, as we repurchase them. Although it got cheaper by today's deal where I think we're going to get to start getting into multi-year in many of our weapon systems, which is a, a big deal. Um, but lowering that cost means creating a, of all the systems Tom and I referred to, uh, directed energy, counter drone drones, although those coyotes, are, coyotes aren't that cheap, uh, Ricky, I think we know that, uh, and gun system and, uh, and um, uh, active EW. You know, if if a CO has three or four layers of that, it's reasonable to allow drones to be done with that. And an ESSM in a last case uh, event, but that, you know, where you pull that, you could get more of those other systems into play before your last chance to fire on an ESSM uh, kind of shot. So, you know, from my point of view, that, but we have to create that condition for the captain. He doesn't, she or he doesn't have that right now. So that's, that's one of the things we have to pull back and, and, and rework. Yeah. And Mark, so, just because they don't, they don't know, we don't know that they work yet, right? So that's yeah. that's the other piece. So real quick, real quick. Um, what we know from the Red Sea is missile defense, air missile defense, did exactly what it was supposed to do, which was to buy time for national decision making, and it has done that in spades, and it's doing it not just day after day, but now week after week and month after month. All right, so missile defense has served its primary purpose purpose of giving time, strategic time for strategic national decision making. So we, we should not, that's critical. That's like number one, actually, of why we why we need miss, air and missile defense. Then you get to the tactical piece, then you get to the, the rest of let, it. Let me just- But it's done its job yeah. there. Thanks, Tom. Mark, let me just throw this line on because I'm looking at Ukraine and what they're doing in the Black Sea, being able to track Russian drones and missiles coming over the Black Sea with buoys and and sensors on that. Why aren't we looking at real application of putting that kind of, whether it's a, it's a remote boat, little boats around your ship to be able to pick up in front like that or unmanned capability with sensors to be able to pick those things up? Why aren't we thinking about that? Are we doing that or? Ricky, I, when I think about this, look, first of all, what we're really talking about here is the interceptor costs. Uh, our detection okay. and systems has been good. Um, now, I do need, we, we do need improved detection capabilities. I'm not sure moving ships that move and carrier strike groups that move rapidly, you know, laying buoy networks down, is it, there's a value in that. But the real value is, Improving our, you know, in a littoral environment like the Pacific, where you have a bunch of land bases that you need to protect, like Misawa, Okinawa, Guam, Tinian, the compact states, um, things off of the Philippines. You want to, you having extra sensors out there that would improve your um, situational awareness of an inbound threat, both in terms of 
Well, it might not be fine quality track quality if it's in a you know some kind of yeah. acoustic center out in the water, but if it's a dirigible up in the air, it could be fire and quality track. We need to start. We need to understand that there are other sensors out there besides our traditional radars and our electronic warfare systems on board ships or land based that we could really help us. And the Israelis are using dirigibles. The Poles are aerostats. The Poles are buying them. We defended Washington, D.C. with them until we got embarrassed. Um, you know, we need to bring back aerostats. We need to investigate, you know, the use of acoustic sensors along the way. That's how we hunt submarines. Yeah. You know, we lay buoy lines, right? Who, and then they who, who, just out of curiosity, who's in charge of this? I mean, it's, what service is well, defending? Is that the Navy now? You put that on the Navy for the sea around uh, the island? It's, little, it's, in, the, you, it's in the air and missile defense. So that's going to go back to the Army? But I think this is our, because look, the principal beneficiary will be the fixed base, the one, the bases whose GPS coordinates can't change, right? They're the ones that are going to need. And more importantly, when you're laying the defensive network, they can enhance that known GPS. I mean, the GPS can yeah, play yeah, their yeah, yeah, yeah. And same with the, the aerostat. Um, you know, these are the kind of things. And look, the Navy happens to bring E2Ds with it a lot of the times, which is a, a, you know, the same kind of service as the aerostat. And, um, and and we have lots of them, and, and and they're ready to go now, as opposed to, say, the wedge tail, which is still, you know, a half a decade to a decade away from full operation, you know, having a, a re reasonable number. So my point on this, Ricky, is I think it's probably the Army, which is, as a you know, as someone who's worked in this area, you know, for the last, uh, and been a fairly joint officer for the last 15, 20 years, it pains me to say that because I don't, they have historically been challenged um, to innovate in this area um, is the nicest way to say it. It doesn't mean they don't kick butt once they get something. I mean, our Patriot warfighters are excellent, but getting yourself to that point has been a challenge for the Army. So, but I do think the aerostats and any kind of acoustic sensor systems, you know, probably because they most support a ground base, the, the defense of fixed so sites like air bases and logistics, it's gonna have to be the Army. So you, the Navy's not going to get stuck with them like Agents of Shore, right? Not, this is going to go right to the Army. By the way, the Navy wasn't of... stuck with Agents of Shore. We need to get off of this because the Navy has adopted a framework that Agents of Shore is bad. As a result, our submarine base in Guam is not defended. If, if the Navy had allowed Agents of Shore to go into Guam three years ago when the CNO was asked and ran from it like it was a case of COVID on the Theodore Roosevelt, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the, um, you know, we'd be in a much better position. We would be building a deck house right now with a spy six or spy seven radar on it. We would be, have a BLS installed. We'd have an agency two installed and we'd be able to shoot down ballistic and, and cruise missiles. We'd have to do some overland testing and we'd be in a position where we could so put you, so you have a capability by 27 that the, the, the oh, war fighter wants by 2020, by 25, you would have had, would have had, would have, should have. Yeah. And That's instead, amazing. look, it's amazing. I blame the Navy for this. The Navy, look, and, and DOD made the final bad decision, but the, and, and they were given bad advice by Jayamdo. But in the end, the Navy, like, you know, taking one step back when they said, any volunteers, please step one step forward, you know, really didn't help the joint force here. And look, getting sailors to live in Guam is not a problem. This was a complete misunderstanding of the challenge facing them that we have in Poland and Romania, we're getting sailors to go on TDYs there is painful. Guam is a, is a, is a well, well respected and easy, reasonably easily filled uh, spot. We would have had no trouble getting sailors from Japan to come over to Guam to, to man that. That was a complete fiasco and we're suffering for it. And you know, I, all the questions that we got ahead of time from people had to do with why can't we defend Guam and what's the Navy doing to defend Guam? And, my answer is we made a mistake five years ago. I'm sorry, four years ago that the Navy did. And we're living with it now because that was amplified by Jam Doe in the Office of Secretary of Defense. Thank you. Can you, you want to hit a couple of questions, Mark? Or do you want to say well, something? We, we have hit them. I mean, honestly, Ricky, I'm looking at all seven of them. The, the, one, cool. the one we hit was, was cybersecurity and look, our cyber is a role. I think if we think that a directed energy and an active EW are going to be our challenges to convince the captain, use those, telling him 
some kind of cyber attack on an inbound missile. I just, you know, the cyber attack's got to be on the targeting systems hours before. So I, I, the, the questioner is right. Cyber is part of it, but it's part of the operational um, line of effort, not the tactical line of effort. The tactical line of effort is what is what uh, Tom hit pretty hard early on. Active EW guns. Um, I throw ESSM in there, um, and, and then uh, active, you know, some active drones. Uh, Tom, why don't you give us a, a minute or two? Rick, if it's okay with you, we have Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom's got Yeah, so I want to go back to the, the uh, Pacific and Mark's point that the Red Sea is not anything that we would see. Um, we should recognize we're not going to have ships in the Taiwan Straits, right, duking it out in high kinetic combat situation with the Chinese Communist Party. Not the place for surface ships, right? Might be a place for other U.S. assets, yeah. but not surface ships in general, right? Um, That's our job is, you know, the job of the service Navy at that point will be to preserve the striking power that comes from our aircraft carriers. A maneuver will be high on that list. Deception will be high on that list. And being a fleet in being and always a threat is important unto itself, regardless of how it's being used, right? So the survival of the of the fleet is very important because it's a constant and present threat to the 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 adversary, right? And being so mobile, and uh, we can, I mean, it's just it it becomes a very difficult problem in the calculus for the Chinese Communist Party. If if they if they can destroy our carriers, then they're they, they don't have to worry about that, and it's really our down to air power. Um, if our Air Force air power. If, our, if the carriers remain as a fleet of being, and we did this a lot during World War II uh, to make sure that when we did engage in combat with our aircraft carriers, it was always at an advantage. That'll be important. We will be fighting at the joint level and the national level because of the range of the Chinese threats, right? These are the anti-ship ballistic missiles, DF-21, DF-26. Um, and this is where left of launch and those kinds of um, cyber attacks or spec ops or whatever to neutralize those becomes really important um none of us want that we want to stay in the deterrent of sway uh at the end of the day the um uh, you get questions like well what if and the answer is the united states Navy will answer the call of the national leaders period whatever they are yeah okay i think we're good and you have any closing comments you, you want to i just say I, look Again, what I would say is our, our sailors and, and officers have done a fantastic job in the Red Sea. Um, I think they've been uh, managed well, and this includes the ones striking targets in Yemen. Uh, you know, every every 48 to 72 hours. Uh, but the kind of whack-a-mole we're doing in Yemen, and the expending weapons, and that's not cheap either, and expending weapons at sea. There is a way to be slightly more cost effective, and that's to shoot the logistics train en route. And we've got to remind ourselves, and look, I get we can't strike Iran proper, but we we could do a lot short of that. And we should be doing more uh, to, to make it a little bit safer and uh, and less expensive uh, for all of us. Thanks, Mark. Tom, you know? No, thanks. I appreciate the engagement. Uh, this has uh, been excellent. Again, uh, totally worth it just to divide, divide the discussion between yeah. nuclear armed hypersonic threats and conventionally armed, which we do need a defense for, right? Totally worth it for today. Covering the events in the in the Red Sea, just so proud to, to be a source of warrior of, of, and, and the, you know, the sailors and officers operating the Aegis weapons system have just done a phenomenal job. And just really proud of. I'll make one last note: sure. USS sure. Carney that you opened with. It's one of our older CDGs, right? And it's being effective in a combat situation today. It's wonderful. I, I just like all of you said, the integration of offense and defense, with offensive strike and defense, is the way to play the game. It's a way to win the game to, to reduce the cost. But that we we're seeing that with Navy first. I think we're seeing that that integrated fires. With Navy on these ships, awesome to 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 pinpoint the Red Sea strategies and what we're doing there with the ships there, and also give a a bigger perspective on on the deterrent of China with what we're doing. You laid out really distinctly that we have engineering capability ready to go 
that we can move that ball from hypersonic glide strike from 34, 35 to 29. You, this laid out the case. You laid out the case. Mark laid out the case. So that that gap's got to get, to come to that side. And I, I think that the, the discussions of cost efficiency was a great perspective for everybody to understand and really the leadership of the U.S. Navy to, in doing this besides the East Shore movement, which, which which delayed the Guam movement. That was a, also a very interesting uh, perspective and, and probably fact there uh, of why we don't have, we may not have Guam defended by 27. Just a great discussion. This is this is why we're doing this kind of stuff. Mark, go ahead. Rick, you say one last thing. I just want to say this is also validation. You know, Tom Druggan spent his last four or five years in uniform building and developing and maintaining and, and uh, modernizing the force that's doing this. And it's a real validation of uh, his good work in his last four or five years in uniform, uh, you know, to put us in the position where we've been yeah. successful. And others are involved too, but but Tom had a leadership role in making that happen. So thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, thanks, thanks Mike. Thanks, Ricky. All right, well, the honors are. Ladies and gentlemen, that was a great discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us.